Hey you guys, today we're going to be talking about shape as an art fundamental. What you should know and why you should care. So first we're going to talk about what it is, then we're going to talk about the ways that it's used, and then at the very end I'm going to talk about how to actually use it. First we're going to talk about what it is, and this is going to be the shortest section of them all. And that's because usually as for a lot of art fundamentals, the actual description of what an art fundamental is, is extremely straightforward and understandable. Now the application and understanding how to use it and then mastering that, that's what takes all the time and energy. But first we have to actually know what it is. Shape is any sort of enclosed line. And what I mean by that, if that's not self-evident, is if we have a line and then we have another line and then we have a third line, that creates a shape. We call that a triangle. We call this a C, right? But it's not a shape yet. We call that a circle. We can go down the line, square, rectangle, but I'm sure you guys get the, uh, the picture here. Now, it's not obvious when you're reading an art textbook or if you're, you're in a beginner art class or even an intermediate or advanced art class how to actually use this and why the hell you should care for your own art making practice. And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now that it's absolutely critical that you understand how to use shapes because all the masters knew it at a very intuitive level. And it'll help your art actually proceed to become better in a very, very obvious way. So we're going to get right into ways that it's used. So the first way that it's used is to describe form. Now, what I mean by that is if you have an object, it has these things called planes. So what a plane is, is that it's a simple flat surface that describes a side of an object. So if we have a simple box right here, then we can see that it has one, two, three visible planes. Now, depending on the way that you actually arrange your shapes, you can describe a 3D form using them as planes. Now, this looks obviously very simple and easily digestible here, but if you look at it in an actual practical application, it can become a little bit harder to see. But this, for example, is gonna show you how it's actually applied in real art. So if we look at this table here, you can see that it curves around like that. And then it has this line right here. And it comes in and you can see that it makes these two different distinct shapes. So this right here refers to that. And this shape refers to that. And if we add on tone, then we can see that it describes that this side of the table is actually in darkness and this side is in light. So that's one way that you can use shapes using different values, and it describes the actual form, the physical 3D object. So the next thing is giving a purpose or variety. So giving a purpose is pretty straightforward, but it can become very complex, and you can get to a very advanced level of design just with shapes, and that's how artists like Frank Frazetta and other illustrators do a lot of their work, is by actually designing their shapes to have a purpose and a thought communicated with them. So a perfect example of this is this painting that we started out with originally. So you can see that this body, although it's very complex and we know that it's a human body and we disregard the fact that it's a physical piece of paper, it's still in 2D space, which means that it's just a simple two-dimensional shape that we can copy down on our paper. So you can see that the actual silhouette of the figure here is this simple kind of tapering shape. So if we, if we actually record that down here, we can see that very simplified, it makes that sort of shape. Now, what this does is that it gives the image a little bit of direction. And by purpose, I actually mean that it gives a good communication as to what's important. So you can see these two lines taper in, and you can feel the energy of the actual shape go up. So you can see it a lot of portraiture of the masters, especially Sergeant uh, Rosetta, Michelangelo, all of them, they understood this idea of the, the subconscious communication that tapering shapes has as for drawing the eye to the subject. So the purpose here is look at this head, right? Because the little girl's head is more important. And tapering shapes is just one way that you can actually communicate purpose using shapes. Another way is through variety. So you could have a composition full of geometrical shapes like this, you know, pentagons, squares, whatever. And then if you have a very organic shape, then that'll communicate a more variety, but a purpose as well, because suddenly your eye, especially if you have another one here, 
your eye is drawn to this shape especially because your eye is fundamentally drawn to difference. A way to think about shapes is what are you trying to say is important in the painting? Because a lot of storytelling and communication, which is what the arts are, music, painting, whatever, it's, you're trying to communicate something to someone. So if you think about it, what the, the most practical way to actually communicate something to someone is by making the point stand out above the rest of the, the muddled details. So that's why in storytelling, you can be more emphatic tonally during the more crucial words or concepts of the story that you're suggesting. And then you'll be loose and fast with the, the more superfluous details. So if you're telling a story to your friend about how you were stuck in traffic for a long time, you're not gonna talk about originally when you got up out of bed and you brushed your teeth and you went downstairs and what you had for breakfast because it's unimportant to the larger purpose or the point of the story. And art is very similar to that. So if we look at art as communication, then we need to think about what the point of the story is, and then we need to use all the tools in our toolbox to actually supplement that point. And you can see that with the taper of shapes and with also variety, just as two little examples, we can start to think about the way that we're designing our compositions to make it more aesthetically obvious what we're trying to say to the viewer subconsciously. And what's really funny is that if you understand all of this fundamental stuff that's extremely boring, I'll admit, then it'll actually translate to work that's much more emotionally evocative for your viewer. All right, so the third way that it's actually used by a lot of artists is that it gives a final sort of craftsmanship, a masterful craftsmanship to your work. So you can see that in a lot of amateur paintings. The problem with a lot of their work is that it looks very unthoughtful and restrained. And what I mean by that is if I'm trying to record a shape, just like we were talking about how it describes forms, because typically we're always making representational paintings. And even if it's abstract painting, it's still representational in the fact that our eyes were designed to see physical space, right? So if I'm copying down a shape from a representational painting, I wanna make sure that it's correct. And amateurs get, or even beginner artists or whatever, they get really caught up in the precision and the accuracy of their shapes not in a bigger scale, but in a more detailed scale. What that's represented as is holding the pencil like this. It normally looks like this, right? And then if they're trying to copy, let's say this head shape, they'll start with the contour and they'll do something like, like that. And they'll try to get all the details and all the stuff in. And what that ends up <clears throat> translating towards is a very ugly shape. So we can kind of see maybe that this is a person, right? But even though you got the representational thing correct, you got the actual aesthetics and design of the shape just god awful. So this looks awful to not make any shapes like that. What you'd want to do instead is that you'd want to give it a simplification, right? And this goes more into how to actually use it, and I'll talk about this more later. But to give your paintings a sense of craftsmanship, it's important that your shapes look more like this to begin with. And although this isn't maybe a direct face already, it looks a little bit more aesthetic because it looks more simplified, right? It doesn't look as tried and hard as this one does. So if you have an entire canvas full of shapes like this, it's gonna really make your craftsmanship suffer a lot. And people can tell that you're more of an amateur painter. It, uh, way to think about it, and I think this is easier for us to visualize for whatever reason, is if you have an entire orchestra, you have the trumpets and the clarinets and the flutes and the, you know, and the whatever, you can think about that as the lines and the shapes and the, the values of the painting and the other art fundamentals, obviously, too. But each instrument has its own part in the actual orchestration of the piece. Now, if you take an individual one by themselves, let's say one trumpet player, and you make them play without the rest of the entire orchestra, it should still sound beautiful. No, no individual instrument should sound ugly, per se. And if you think about it in that sort of sense, it'd be obvious that one trumpet that sounded god-awful would stand out above the rest and it would ruin the piece. It's the same for your shapes and your lines and your values. If you have one shape, even one in your composition that just looks 
muddled and ugly and overthought, it's going to be really bad. And your entire piece sings with continuity. So you want your entire piece to have a lot of thought and simplification put into it and that design that we've been talking about. That'll make it look much better. So it gives your final piece a uh, masterful craftsmanship. That's the final way that it's used. And there's obviously more to this that list, but I'm going to stop it there just to keep this video a little shorter. All right, so now into the most important part how to actually use it. So we've talked about what it is, it's an enclosed line. We've talked about the more complicated things and the ways that it's actually applied in artwork in different sort of settings and for different reasons. But now we're gonna talk about how to take those things that we talked about, about how it's used and how you're actually gonna physically apply it into your own artwork. So when we're talking about how it describes form with planes, you need to make them accurate. And that's the way that you actually describe form in the most efficient way. Now, you can use constructive anatomy, and you can use these methods of, like, the Loomis method and the Riley method and all that stuff to actually construct the face. But a way that a lot of other artists actually create a sense of realism is through copying shapes down one by one. And it's not like one method is, is better than the other. They're actually used best when they're put in tandem together. But a very powerful tool in your representational artwork toolbox is to make accurate shapes. So let's say, for example, that I'm trying to top, copy this figure from Johnson & Sargent down onto this paper. If I'm trying to do that, what I would do is that I would use proportions, angles, and other things to actually make sure that the shapes that I'm placing are not only representation of what I'm seeing, but they're proportional relative to the other shapes. So if I'm drawing this head right here, I'm not going to think about it in all of its complexity, right? Because there's a lot of information there. There's colors, there's values, and there's all this other stuff. But all we need to care about is one sort of principle at a time because you consciously can't pay attention to two things at once. That's just physically impossible. So what we're going to think about is just simplifying that head into a simple ball. Now, that's obviously not going to be precisely what it is, but it's a good, it's a very good placeholder just to begin with. So next, what we're going to do is that we're going to just think about the general proportion of the figure. So I'm sure you can always already see the application of shapes, right? So I just copy down this shape. And although it's not perfect, and I'd go in and actually fix it up, you can see how this is a shape right here, right? And it's a very light value shape. And it actually makes up the neck and chest of the woman, right? And when you actually add a bunch of shapes to a composition like this, and you've described them very accurately, it starts looking like, or something like this. So I, I made a, this read yesterday or the day before that, but it's, this is just a quick three or four minute sketch. And the way that I'm able to actually sketch this pretty quickly and, you're, and you actually know what it is, is by using these shapes. So I was sketching everything out really simply like this, and I'm actually gonna do an overlay of the video so you know what I'm doing. And you can see that just by using accurate shapes and of course values, but that's gonna be another video, it actually gives a very good depiction of what you're trying to visually represent on the paper. So just thinking about general shapes, you don't have to actually draw the hand, you don't have to draw the features of the face. If you get the general value shapes correct in the figure, it's going to make your stuff look more representationally real, which is that describing form that we talked about. Okay, so the next thing that we're talking about is how to actually use it, how to give it a purpose, how to actually use that variety and those tapering shapes we were referring to earlier. But instead of talking in the abstract, I'm actually going to give you an example from one of the best portrait artists of all time, John Singer Sargent. So you can see in this portrait, it looks like just a normal portrait that, you know, the, the sitter rolled in and it, he just painted her without any thought. And that's actually not how these things work. A lot of the time, the artist is very unconsciously or consciously aware of what's abstractly happening here. So if we abstract, abstract out what's happening in the, the shape language of this painting we can see that there's very organic shapes right at the bottom. We can see that it makes up these very square-like shapes. That one's a triangle, but they're very geometrical, just like I was talking about earlier. You can see just how geometrical this, the shape language of this dress is, right? So we got that square right down there. And then we got that triangle and all that stuff. 
And this gives a very linear kind of cut edge to it. And you can see that up here, John Singer Sargent, he used more organic shapes. So in the, in the, in the dress here, you can see more of a curve and they don't, they don't feel as man-made. It feels more like it was made by happenstance, right? And we can see visually what that does is that since this shape is so much bigger visually, it actually comes down like right to here. And this one's so much smaller. You have this big geometrical shape and you have this smaller, more organic shape in a sea of a composition that shows off geometrical shapes. And what that does is that it brings the attention to this part of the subject. And just like we were talking earlier with story time, <laughs> which is what we're doing all day. And that's what art is, right? It's just, it's a basic narrative, even if it's an abstract sense. What you're doing is that you're trying to bring attention to the face of the subject. And the way that you might do that is through this, this underlying subconscious shape language. Mention also the taper here, right? So if we abstract, the, the values actually gets rid of this shape right here because it more merges into the, into the background. But you can see that this shape abstractly tapers into the subject again. So you're always going to want to think about the way that you're, tapering your shapes and the actual line work if, if it's organic or if it's linear and that'll that'll subconsciously tell your viewer what's important or not now the last one that we're going to be talking about is the masterful craftsmanship this is really critical work to use simplification and exaggeration so what do i mean by that all right so a perfect example of simplification and exaggeration is in this little figure that i did here so there's a little bit of <laughs> nudity because I was copying some Frazetta figures down. So I'm going to cover those up just for uh, monetization of those other things. But this figure right here, I took off this reference, and I think it really represents the simplicity and exaggeration that gives shapes its kind of masterful look. And a lot of masters use this idea to a very high extent. So you can see that this, this line right here from the, the nape of the neck all the way down to the knee is just this very simple curve. Like there, there's almost no variance in it. There's a little bit right here uh, where the chest is and also a little bit where the where the pelvis is. But other than that, it's really just like a simple curve, right? And as we know, lines actually make up shapes just like we showed in the beginning of the video. So if you have simple lines, then you're gonna have simple shapes. That's just how it works. It's like putting in carrots and peas into a bowl of soup, and what do you have? You have a, you have a carrot and pea soup, you know? <laughs> so you want to make your line work really beautiful, and that'll end up making your shapes look much more masterful. And when I'm talking about exaggeration, that has to do more with gesture. And just like how we talked about with lines influencing the end shape, if we have something in our reference that looks more like this, then we can see that it has a general sort of flow to it right and we can simplify it and this left line would be the simplification of it and then we can also kind of exaggerate it right we can really push out the actual essence of what it is and when you're doing that <clears throat> and you do that everywhere all over the image it kind of gives this image a bigger than life look and when you're quick sketching because this can get in the way of how representation would correct the images if you do it incorrectly or too much but if you have an image and it has a sense of flow to it and you exaggerate it, it's gonna give the it's gonna give the final product a lot of visual interest. If we see here with the two hands and the nape and the neck here, you can see that from this hand all the way down to there, it gives this very flowy line. So you can actually do this. And if you put that down as your original sketch, then you're gonna build a lot of shapes on top of that that give it this kind of flow and exaggeration and simplicity. Because now when I build on the more uh, basic parts of the hand, for example, and I'm still using simple lines to create it, it has this underlying sort of rhythm to it. It feels like it has a lot of energy, right? And when you have a lot of abstract push and force in the line work underneath your, your drawing or painting, it's gonna make the final product look a lot better. So anyways, I hope you guys learned a thing or two about shapes. If you could comment below and let me know the next art fundamental that you guys wanna learn, that'd be great. I hope you guys have a great day and all the best. Thanks for watching.
go make something beautiful and I'll see you guys later. Bye.